I'll go ahead and start taking questions or comments. Uh, Anu? Namaste. Could you kindly elaborate, please, uh, on what all mentality and materiality ceases means? Sure. Well, mentality is any mental activity at all. And materiality is, is any physicality at all. So first, the, the materiality will drop. We won't have a sense. Uh, and we're talking about opening this experience of cessation opening. So as we move deeper into the peace and stillness, there will be less of a sense of a physicality of a body of any kind. And at some point, thoughts become sparse and they quiet uh, to the point of complete stillness. So we're operating with consciousness. So we have a kind of awareness and a knowingness. And then we also have direct awareness. So we know by direct experience. And then consciousness will fall away, leaving just awareness. And this is non-conceptual awareness. So it's not awareness where we're referencing anything else. We're just knowing our experience by the direct contact. And then finally, that awareness turns off and there's just blackness. So it's a dreamless sleep is how it appears. So if someone's having dreams, that's not cessation. If there's any mentalizing, that's not cessation. So it's a very specific experience that's been a fundamental experience uh, in Buddhism since the start. May I please paraphrase to make sure that I've understood you, please? Mm -hmm. So when we say materiality ceases, we mean that we lose sense of a body. We don't, we are not aware of a body. We're, we don't perceive a body. Mm -hmm. We, is that understanding correct? Right. And, and there's no sense of having a location that comes with the materiality ceasing. I see. Okay. And when we say mentality ceases, thoughts uh, completely cease. There are no thoughts, no mental images. And uh, there's just awareness. Right. At the very end, there's just awareness. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Elena. Oh, great, thanks, Kathleen. I'll let you call them. Elaine, I'm asking you to unmute. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I, I'm afraid I can't turn on my video. Um, I, I have the same kind of question. Um, and thank you for, for that lovely meditation. Um, so, if, if you say cessation, I, I would assume that on some level, the body is continuing and breathing is going on. I mean, is there any sense of what happens to the body? And the, the other side of it is, is it, is it because our, 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 our consciousness or our brain or whatever it is that can perceive is not yet able to just sort of I don't have the words I'm sorry, mm -hmm. to process to process yep. the experience um because something if I may be so bold I'm assuming something happens mm -hmm. and that the experiencer is not only changed but perhaps profoundly changed right um and yet there there is like, you may not have the words or the concepts or anything, but you know, something has happened. And um, is it like something that, that we can't on this level <laughs> bring it back? Is, is that kind of what's I, happening? Or maybe that's not even an important thing to think about, but. Well, just re remember, we're, we're using concepts to talk about something that's non-conceptual. There aren't words, yeah. there aren't thoughts that will adequately describe it. So what I'm describing is based on direct experience. 
there's no sense of the body at all. There's no sense of a me. There's no thought. There's no history. There's no emotions. Any ways that we can mark ourselves, this is me, are absent. And I will say also that from my own experience in working with other teachers and students, that the duration of cessation uh, has an impact. So if one were to have uh, a, a minute, five minutes in cessation, that would be significant to them because they would have the knowing that this is a real experience. It's a real phenomenon. But with that kind of a duration, there probably wouldn't be any significant change. Mm -hmm. My observation is it would it takes at least 30 minutes or more in cessation for there to be a kind of profound change. I, I sometimes talk about it as being it's like going away on vacation mm -hmm. and coming home mm -hmm. to find all the furniture in your house is rearranged. So the internal processing sense of self structuring of me can all be affected. And, and, and there's really a sense of something really important just happened. Something just beyond important happened. So, so that's part of the process of, of cessation. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, is there any any danger of dying during? I mean, in a way, it sounds like a death, but but the body continues. The body is breathing. There's there's no sense that all of that has stopped. Or... Well, you you see a body before you, so yes. clearly this body didn't <laughs> die. I've I've never had any students who have expired on me doing cessation practice. So. <laughs> I, I, I will say this, there, th that is one of the last resistances to cessation fully opening, mm -hmm. is that primal survival anxiety. I don't know how to end this. I can tell something really significant is opening. And again, this isn't part of our processing, but by direct awareness, we know this. And so it has to be, we have to come from a place of such complete trust yeah. that we're willing to let go and not know how it ends, not know how we return. And it, everyone that I know who's had the experience, they've, the awareness has come back into the body and they've gone on with life. So that does happen. It doesn't mean things don't change but it means people can get on with their lives in a fairly normal way. But, but things are different. When you've been to the source, you know, my, my teacher calls it the state of no state. When you've touched into that, that's the core of all reality, all manifestation. So it's very, very potent to be in. One of the secrets of Buddhism is any practices that are really discreet, that are really subtle, are generally the most potent and powerful experiences. Yeah. And that's how this is. It feels so, so smooth and there's so much peace and stillness. Yeah. It just yeah. feels exquisite. And yet it's this profound experience of complete union with yeah. cessation. There's just cessation. There's nothing else. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. I will ask Rick to unmute and then Stephen, I think we'll take a question from Jenny at 6.52. I'll read it to you, okay? But let's okay. have Rick unmute first, if that's okay. Am I unmuted? Yes. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you again for your wonderful talk, Stephen and uh, meditation. It's been a while since I've been away, since I've been uh, participating in Wednesday night meditation with Rick and, and his amazing guests. So I want to thank you for being here. Um, it's nice to be back. And um, yeah, this is this is a kind of a very basic question. Like I've never been on 
a retreat. When I was much younger in my 20s, I was actually part of a, I was a member of an ashram. Uh, and I'm not sure how much value I actually got out of that. Um, that's that's a, maybe a discussion for a whole other time. But that was a long time ago. And, and since then, I've never, you know, people talk about going on retreats a lot in this community. And I guess my question is this, is um, if I have a goal or an aspiration to like experience in a deep way, this matter of cessation, is that something I can do on my own or you absolutely have to do it like in a community setting, go, you know, on retreat for, mm -hmm. you know, a week or two? Yeah, it, uh, certainly in any of these experiences can happen spontaneously. It's fairly rare, as you can imagine, that that happens. So typically it takes a sustained practice period. Uh, I have students that experience, have experienced cessation even on one-week retreats. Two-week retreats are more common that it can happen. But it's usually folks who have worked with me for a while, uh, they're one of the components I see, because the other area I really stress in my teaching is awakening, you know, what's called Kensho in the Zen tradition. And with both of those, one of the most important qualities the student brings is trust. I have students now on when I teach retreats, check in and see what's their level of trust with both me as a teacher and the teaching. And I'm seeing a correlation that if and of course, I want people to be honest with themselves. They don't need to give me a high score for my benefit, but to see where they are. And I found that people who are operating and reporting themselves, say, a 10 on a 1 to 10 scale in trust, they're a lot more open, more prone to these experiences. And I think because they can trust enough what I'm saying and who I am that they can let go. That's my my theory. You know, it's small sampling so i can't make any conclusions based on that but i would say retreat would be really important to do uh there's certainly these days zoom retreats people do so that's a possibility but there's nothing like a residential in-person retreat there's something about sitting together hour after hour day after day in this field that just keeps getting deeper and more rich with whatever qualities are present that is just unmatched so I would encourage you to you know, find a teacher you want to work with and find a retreat that speaks to you and give it a try. Sure. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Okay, Stephen, I'm going to read Jenny's question from 652. Okay. And just a note to everyone, if you're having, if you want to raise your hand, go down to the bottom of your screen and there should be a little reactions emoji. And if you click on that, it usually has a, it has a place where it says raise hand, okay. Um, but Jenny asked, how would you teach clear, light, unconditional love to individuals in war situations? And then it's really a two-part question. How do we- let me, let, me, let me start there. I'll do one at a time. It's easier <laughs> for me. Uh, um, anybody who's experiencing severe trauma or has experienced severe trauma really has it's almost like they have a little more access to love in some fashion mm -hmm. and i know that sounds counterintuitive but it's almost like because they've been to very uh, deep places of suffering it's almost like a lot of those folks have an easier time opening, trusting uh, what's unconditioned, the oneness of love. So I do have students who have been through severe trauma that I work with um, in the course of retreats and whatnot, and they have to come in with a lot of love. So I start everyone out with practicing what I call innate goodness meditation, which is it's similar to what we did tonight. All right, so, uh, and, and going on to the second question, Kathleen. Yeah, the second question was, how do we understand the existence of war and violence mm -hmm. in an unconditionally loving universe? Yeah, 
That's a great question, important question. And, and I would broaden that to say, how do we explain the harm others intentionally cause to other humans or the world or animals? How do we explain that if we have this unconditioned source where we have pure love? Uh, how does that work? So if we think about it, it's like a mountain stream coming into a city. And in this city, the water comes in eventually to large water pipes. And on some of the pipes, there are filters. And the filters have been collecting sediment over the years to the point that the water coming through this pure, fresh mountain stream is becoming in effect polluted by the contact with the material in the filter. In the same way, psychologically, the unconditioned love is manifesting in everyone, but it's coming through psychological distortions, uh, unhealthy perspectives, and unresolved trauma. And that ends up becoming a motivator for people where the love gets distorted into actions that are destructive and can be harmful. And this is where the personality becomes the lead. So people in wartime, how often are the leaders uh, struggling, trying to dominate others in the world, trying to take things that aren't theirs? So it, it gets us in, gets those folks into deeply into their psychological wounding and their workarounds and their dysfunctional behavior. But if we work, a lot of my teaching is around paying attention to our psychology, to our personality material, and working on that both pre-Kensho, pre-awakening, and post-Kensho. There's a different way it's worked after awakening. But we continue to work our personal material, refining and purifying all the time, as well as turning towards deep experiences like these meditations or awakenings, realizations. So we're, I call it the stair-step method, where we take a step, let's say we have a transcendent experience, and then that transcendent experience is going to highlight whatever in our personality is incongruent with that realization. And so that gives us our places to work. We work those, when we work enough of that material, we open and then another realization can occur. And then we work material that gets highlighted based on that realization. So it's an ongoing process. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Uh, Kim, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Hello. Thank you so much for the beautiful meditation. I really appreciate everyone being here tonight. I just wanted to say that I've had the pleasure of experiencing the cessation event multiple times and um, both at retreat and personally at home in meditation. Mm -hmm. And um, just to share with others, like the the only way that I knew something had happened was I came back and I knew I had not been asleep but there was this crystalline clarity, psychological right. clarity, um, physical clarity too, just this pure blankness, I guess, for lack of better words. And um, so I'd had that a few times and I was curious to know about how, if you reach that state, how can you extend the time that you're there? The only way you can do that, and first let me say, uh, yeah, talking about the clarity, that's one of the qualities of post-cessation is there's a kind of clarity and also a kind of refreshment, a kind of rejuvenation that's remarkable. We, we, we've never experienced this level of rest, relaxation, energy, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So that's absolutely on point with this experience. Uh, the only way that you can work with time with cessation is while you're still having some mental activity. So you're, you'd be going deeper into the stillness and peacefulness. You would set a time resolve. May cessation arise for 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And you just leave it there. You let go. And um, it can get to where those work. We, we can establish the time and we stay in, or let's say we disappear into cessation and then reappear 
uh, at the appointed time. So that would be the only suggestion that I would have. But I would suggest mostly working. I hope you have a teacher that knows cessation because um, it's helpful to have somebody who's experienced it quite a bit and can mm -hmm. guide you and uh, anchor and confirm it. Awesome. Thank you. And I just wanted to make one last comment about it is that I, and during one experience when I was with a small group for sort of a private retreat, I had the experience of that. And afterwards, I had a very distinct period of time over the next day where I had zero mental chatter, mm -hmm. zero uh, inner voice, um, you know, thoughts, errant thoughts, et cetera. It was so fascinating to be mm -hmm. in that state. It's um, obviously worth going for yeah. <laughs> often. Well, well, and what this shows is, is both you don't need that inner chatter to function and you're not your inner chatter. Mm -hmm. So those are important understandings to have from this. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Yeah, thank you. Sylvia, I'm going to ask you to unmute. If you can turn on your camera, that would be great. Oh, I, I don't know how to do it. Can you listen? Yes, can hear you. you can okay, listen. thank you very much. I do not have all the experience in order to talk in the way that you are talking, but I have um, all the time I am reading and learning a lot. And I conclude that is something that is very important. My question is very basic and is uh, from my own experience. I think that my brain is a machine whose uh, function is to create thoughts. And I believe that I am not defined, but my machine, that doesn't have nothing to do with me. The only thing that I do is to watch without thinking, without trying to label things, just to rest in observation, trying to avoid, to react, not to feel guilty or praise myself or avoiding feelings or things, I just respect everything that comes. But I think that in the moment that I am not putting labels, I feel that I am free to show compassion towards myself as well as all living beings. In that moment, that is a fraction of a second. I feel free. I feel that I simply exist, free and ready to continue embracing life as an unfold before me. But I, I don't know what to do with this knowledge. I don't know. I, I, I feel a kind of peace, but I, what, what is going on in my life or what is the point that I reach? I don't understand. I remember that one day I was too depressed mm -hmm. and I don't know how. I, they, just the knowledge came to me and said Dharmakaya. And immediately my mind jumps to Dharmakaya and I, I engage without knowledge, without things. I don't know if I am getting crazy, but I stay there and I got the peace and that peace I bring him back with me in my real life. I was surprised. I was scared. I didn't really understand what is going on. But I noticed that I can change minds, and that is crazy. How can I explain that? I don't have a way. And that everything occurs in a second, but was so powerful that still I have, I, I, in some way, it's like a, I am become more a kind of lake, a serene lake. I have all my issues but not in the degree that before I had. Can you tell me, please, what is going on in my life in this experience, please? 
Well, you're, you're making contact with the absolute. The Dharmakaya is another name for the absolute. So that's what you're making contact with. I'd really encourage you to uh, find a teacher that you trust uh, and can work with because you'd really benefit from working with the teacher more closely if you're not already. No, I, I am not because I am waiting. You, everything is so new. I am so curious for so many years, maybe 15 years, trying to read by myself, trying to have a very honest life, trying to do things, but uh, um, it's difficult for me to move from one religion to the next. And I'm very familiar about many things, but if I can tell you when people ask me, who are you? I mm -hmm. have a lot of problems because I don't know who I am. And <laughs> believe me, I feel very happy and I feel free. And when I know that my conscious, my blood of consciousness mm -hmm. is going to change in the next reincarnation, in the another, in another, until I reach Dharmakaya, Mm -hmm. Believe me, I don't feel that I really want to be Sylvia Porras. I don't. I, do, I, I don't believe in, in Sylvia Porras, really. It's just I am a, a, a dependent, a rising mm -hmm. human being that is living an experience that is a dream. And I have to embrace whatever karma brought to me in order to burn all these things and to try to use compassion all the time. Mm -hmm. That is the, what I think in my own primitive knowledge, what I think is my own reality in this moment. Yeah, if, if, you're, if you're free of identity, then it doesn't matter what name is used. So that's not a big concern. The better question rather than who am I to ask yourself is what am I? And that'll get more traction for you in continuing with this. Thank you. And again, I, I'd really encourage you to work with a teacher. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you, Sylvia. Um, Anu, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Thank you for turning on your camera. So, Anu, um, maybe you could be very brief because we have already had a question from you. Okay, I'm going to take a question from Steve, ask Steve to unmute since we have not had a question from him. Okay, Steve, I'm asking you to unmute. Great, thank you very much. Um, Perhaps you could describe a little bit about the difference between um, cessation and pure, unfiltered, direct awareness. Mm -hmm. As I use the term pure awareness, I mean non-conceptual awareness. So it's awareness, normal awareness will have an experience and then it will relate it to something in our history. You know, the famous line, oh, you try a new meat, this tastes like chicken. Well, that's an example of conceptual, we're using conceptual awareness. We're relating it to something we've already experienced, and that makes us feel safer. So this is awareness I'm talking about. Pure awareness is direct experience only. There's no conceptualization going on. And cessation is where all mentality and materiality cease. So there's a nothingness, a blackness, and there's no sense of a self, there's no thoughts, there's no, no markers of me at all present. And, but there's a clearness in, in the dark experience. So it's not muddled, there's a clarity, but it's a lights out experience. So again, a dreamless sleep is the closest we can associate or language cessation but it's one where we don't have control. We can't choose to start it. We don't choose when it concludes other than if we can get skilled at time resolves, that's the only possibility. Otherwise, it, there's a certain serendipitousness to it. Does that make sense what I'm saying about pure awareness and cessation? Oh, you're on mute, okay. 
Thank you, Steve. Um, Stephen, I'm going to hook on a question that came from Tony at 658 because it's quite related to uh, Steve's question. And it, the question is, uh, is there a connection between cessation and bliss? Uh, well, bliss is a felt sense. It's, it can be a differentiated quality of the manifest absolute. So the love can differentiate into equanimity, compassion, uh, and, and more. And bliss can be one of the experiences. We can talk about joy or bliss. And it's the experience of the contact with the absolute is what gives us that the rising of those kinds of reactions to it. But we wouldn't have uh, bliss in cessation. Cessation, there's nothing. Everything shuts down. There would be no bliss. There would be no one to feel bliss. There would be no awareness to perceive bliss, no consciousness to relate to it. There's nothing. So bliss wouldn't be a part of that experience. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm going to ask Julia to unmute. And Julia, if you could turn on your camera, we would be so grateful. Um, hey, so I have a question about, um, reality. So like, um, you know how like everybody has a unique experience of their lives. Um, if you want to be like enlightened, like the Buddha and you want to understand like the re the, the most truthful reality, like from everybody's perspective, how do you know that you're there? <laughs> like, how do you know that like when you wake up and you think about reality, how do you know that you've seen enough to know that you the way you see reality is going to be is going to be everybody's reality. Well, that that comes either from two experiences in Buddhism uh, would be one would be cessation that would undermine conventional reality and our conventional sense of self. So those would be perhaps not concluded, but they would be softened. And the other is through awakening experiences, waking up out of the belief that I'm just the separate self, waking up, and in effect, awakening means the absolute awakens to itself in a particular specific consciousness. So the absolute awakens where you, you are. It's not your experience, it's the absolute's experience, but you begin to understand reality, unconditioned reality, and then that begins influencing your perception of conditioned reality. And that becomes the post awakening work of working on our personality material and our psychological material and our perspectives to more and more orient towards the perspective of the absolute. Thank you. Hey, Marion, I'm going to ask you to unmute. And if you would turn on your camera again, we'd be so grateful. Thank you, um, and, and thank you, Stephen, uh, for clarifying a process in meditation that so far eluded me. Um, and I've never known how to conceptually understand those next steps or to feel safe with, with some experiences I've had at a certain mm -hmm. stage. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little more about um, allowing oneself or finding that trust in the process to be able to move forward into mm -hmm. deeper states of, well, non-awareness, I think, is what, what would be called into a cessation. Yeah, what, what I'll, I'll step back a little bit from your question and reframe it as what, um, what can we do to orient ourselves? How can we develop greater trust in contacting the absolute, which could include potentially cessation? And really what it comes down to is when we have new experiences, spiritual or meditative experiences, meaning our, our awareness, our consciousness expands to a new dimension. Say, say in the past, you've gotten to here, you're on a retreat and it expands to here. So it goes 
you know, 50% larger. Well, part of what happens after that experience is the personality freaks out and tries to snap our, our awareness back into that nice tight hold that the personality is known for. So just to say that's a common phenomenon for people is that it, it I, I call it the accordion effect. Whenever we go to new space, it always is, is followed at some point by a, a collapse or a pulling in. So part of what we do is we recognize that, we also recognize that we had an experience that was more significant than we've had before. And we have to tell ourselves nothing bad happened. And that begins to develop trust. It takes it out of faith, which means I'm believing somebody else or something else to trust. I know this for myself. You don't need to believe a word I say. You don't need to trust my languaging. You know it for you directly. And we keep building that trust with each new experience. And that lets us trust and, and relax more and more as we go deeper into the absolute territory or realm. Thank you. You're welcome. I am gonna to jump to Meredith. I, Anu, I see your hand raised, but I'm gonna um, take people who haven't spoken first. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, okay, Meredith, I just asked you to unmute. There you go. Thank you. Well, you know, I'm very sorry I missed your talk. So I apologize for getting here late. And I'm, I am sorry, because this conversation is very interesting. And I raised my hand because uh, I don't know if this is pertinent to the general conversation right now, but I'll find out. Um, I once had a, an experience um, where essentially, uh, it was as if all the definitions of things, names of things, were were, were gone. And I, uh, I mean, I guess the sense is they were lifted, but I don't know if that matters. But um, I mean to say refreshing, meaning um, I could see that. <laughs> The way we see as human beings is all human named, basically. I mean, often, generally speaking. And I don't know if I've ever mentioned this to anyone, but is that in? Is that um, what would? Is that something you would call something? <laughs> <laughs> speaking yeah, of the, all, we. We could talk about that as having direct experience. It's pure awareness. Okay. So you're experiencing directly without concept. Right. And you're also having the realization that all of our conditioned world is structured around agreement around concepts. We, we agree that time moves like this. We agree that all these different things happen in this certain way and, and it becomes a common understanding. But when you step outside that to direct experience, then you see, well, it really doesn't happen that way. It's really, there, there really is no time. There's only the present moment. There's no past or future. Those are concepts. And when we start meeting things without concept, we're, we're seeing things. I like to say we're seeing nature as nature sees itself. Oh, yes, beautiful. So that's what it's like. But but it's an important experience to see because you can see that you you can still survive and have awareness and contact without having concepts. So that's a very liberative experience to know that freedom. And what I would ask you is, who knew what was happening when there were no concepts? Or what was happening? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, it's okay if you don't know the answer. Yeah, I don't know if it has a name. Huh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but there was a knowing somehow. Absolutely. Right. It was seen. I could see. It was well, just wonderful. Was the knowing you or not you? 
I think I've just been uh, asking myself that a long time. Um, so no, um, both. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's great talking with you. Thank you so much. Well, and also for those of you asking these kinds yeah. of questions, I do the book Demystifying Awakening which goes through some of this and explains, it'll give a context for some of the experiences some of you are sharing. You'll understand their, their sort of experiences on the, on the road toward awakening. Yeah. So Stephen, sorry, right. Stephen, can you take one more question? Sure. We're almost at 7.30, okay. Uh, Mary Lynn, I'm gonna ask you to unmute and turn on your camera. Thank you. Oh, hi, uh, Stephen and everybody. Hi. It's very nice to meet you, Stephen, on here. Um, it was an amazing meditation. Um, I, I had a comment and then a question. Um, uh, but I'll start with a quick question, though. Um, is this um, cessation event referring to Niroda Samapati? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. OK, I got that right. Um, yes, OK, thank you. So I just wanted my comment is that, you know, as I'm listening to this um, idea of like non-conceptual consciousness. Um, uh, I've had a lot of really intense experiences in my life. I have a very severe trauma history, but I was also a Montessori preschool teacher. And in those years, I remember it was so magical because the children are really non-conceptual at the age that I was um, attending to them at two and a half to six years old. And so my, my job really was to help them identify the environment. Um, this is a chair, this is a table, this is the sky, this is an apple tree. And so it was like they were really coming from a really non-conceptual place and I had to help them learn how to be on planet Earth and identify everything. So it occurs to me in this discussion that really like little children are at that place and then we're teaching them the concepts. And, and then at this age, at my age of 63, I'm, I'm really in the process of unlearning all of the attachment to concept. But um, luckily I've had like really intense experiences when I was much younger at 18 by sort of mistake. I ended up um, on um, um, angel dust, not even knowing. I, I only found out recently that that's what I had been given. Um, and I had, I had a totally uh, powerful 48 hour experiences, experience of being beyond time and space. It was really freaky. It was very, very intense and powerful. But I think I was in that place of non-conceptual because I couldn't even have, I didn't have words at, in mm -hmm. that state. Um, and then I've also experienced universal love through MDMA and psilocybin for um, plant medicine healing therapy. And, uh, and that was that sense of total expansiveness. And there were really hardly any words to that either. So I think that I have certainly touched upon uh, what we're talking about here is that of that non-conceptual consciousness, which is absolutely wonderful. So that's my comment. Um, let me, what let I want to jump ask... in. Let me, let me jump in for a second. The, the first is that I, I want to be clear that concepts aren't the problem. It's our mm -hmm. allegiance to the concepts that's the problem. Right. Yes. We make it the fundamental reality mm -hmm. and it's not. And then the other thing I would say to you is just, I would really invite you to, you know, explore doing in-person retreat and trying to open to these experiences without the assistance of the plants and the other. Right. Uh, I have been working on that here mm -hmm. is without the assistance of that. Good. So now that I kind of was introduced through those experiences. I, I don't feel I need that anymore. I can access it on my own. And also um, your, it'll build your trust. You know, right. they're real. Yeah. So go yeah, ahead with your question. Exactly. So uh, my question was just uh, sort of, uh, you touched upon it earlier about how there's there seems to be some correlation with people who've had severe trauma and then their access to this state uh, is easier because of the greater trust. And, and it is counterintuitive because when you've had severe trauma, particularly if it's abusive type trauma, um, then the trust is not there, but yet, in my case, I think I have a greater trust for the spiritual realm than I do for mm -hmm. the human realm, if you know what I mean. Um, but I'd be in cu curious to hear you expound on that and 
what have you found about that correlation between people with severe trauma and access, easier access to this state? Yeah, it seems that folks that have had, uh, and this, is, this wouldn't be everyone, but some of the subgroup within the severe trauma sufferers who are called to a spiritual path have more immediate access to some of the transcendent states. Having said that, I will say also that they can't stay long in the in the transcendent state. Mm -hmm. If they go through the process of learning the meditation that opens one to these experiences, then we're building a kind of uh, structure. We have a foundation, a first floor, et cetera. And then there's greater stability. So, so they can know the experience, again, easier than, say, a non-severe trauma sufferer if we're generalizing. But, but it's not one that can be sustained, typically. At least that's my observation. Mm -hmm. So what happens in that case? Uh, does the person go into panic mode or what would typically happen? It depends on the person a lot. Mm -hmm. and, and the trauma, how severe it was, seems to make a difference. But, but it's also, you know, my, one of my theories is that those with severe trauma learn to go away during the trauma often. They yeah. get a habit pattern. So Disso they're used to, to being away from personality. Go ahead. I'm sorry, do you mean dissociation? Something, I, I don't want to use that term because it's not always kind of clinically that. And again, I'm not trained as a psychologist or therapist mm -hmm. or anything. This is just my own understanding. But, but because they've learned how to go away, they seem to have more access in going into the absolute. And that's what comes to me as a possibility that they have greater trust in letting go and being away from the personality. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I've, I've only worked with a, a small number of people, so I can't really make blanket statements because it's mm -hmm. too small of a sampling. Mm -hmm. Mary, well, was Mary, very interesting. Thank so you so much. much. Yeah, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. um, Stephen, I think we're really out of time here. Okay. But Great. there were lots of good questions in the chat too, and some people asked about retreats and. Sure. And retreats I, I've and got I've got a website, awakeningdharma.org. Yeah, and, and for those of you who want to go to that website, if you go to the invitation, the email invitation today, there's Stephen's name is right there, and you can click his name, and it goes right to his website. I just checked yeah. it. And there, all my books and retreats and all the stuff I'm doing are all on there, so you can see if um, anything's interesting to anybody, then they can let me know. Well, thank you all for letting me be with you tonight. I really enjoyed the time together and all your questions and comments and your lovely practice and look forward to the next time that we are together. Until then, please be well.